Hello, hello, everybody. Hello. Hey there. Hold on. Let's get everybody in. Wow. What a very special series we are about to start. Ah, oh, unbelievable. Okay. Got a bunch of people joining. Stay tuned. I am busy opening the doors of Zoom. Hi, Ari. Hi, Ari. It's as loud as it'll go. My, I don't have a lot. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Are you putting it on the TV or no? Well, right now, if you can. Okay, let's get everybody in. A quick moment here. <laughs> All right. Let's welcome everybody. Sandy, welcome. It's great to see you. Hey, Yaakov, great to see you. Hey. Hey, David, great to see you. Trish, great to see you. Shmuley, welcome, welcome from California. All right. Hey, Josh, good to see you. Donna and Fred. Welcome, welcome, great to see you. Howard, from Aleichem, welcome, good to see you. Mom, great to see you. Donna, great to see you. Sarah, live from the Sunshine State, great to see you. Doris, great to see you. Hi, Ari. Mike, Hi. Hey, good to see Mike and Rose, hopefully good to see you. Anastasia, great to see you. Jerry, welcome. Great to see you. Catherine, great to see you. Alex, great to see you. Howard, great to see you. I see Rose, great to see you. And Susan, it is great to see you. Okay, my friends, we are all in for a treat over the next few weeks because we have a very special series. I am going to do a few things here. All right, first thing I'm going to do is mute everybody. Just so we have a nice clean background to get started. At any point, jump in, unmute to allow yourself to ask a question, to comment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's get rolling. All right, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our brand new series. This is the Kabbalah of the Matrix, and I am thrilled to have you here. This is going to be an amazing experience where we explore the matrix, Kabbalah, and lots of really, really powerful ideas. First off, I want to I want to express a very special thank you to our incredible core sponsors, Eve Bogan, Alex and Laura Doman, Trish Elabash, Howard Feinsand, Fred and Donna Herbert, Vlad Rabinovich, and Jay and Susan Rosenheck. Thank you very much for supporting this series and for helping us get this course off the ground and for bringing these Torah teachings to the community and ultimately to the world. So thank you for your support. Thank all of you for being here and for your support. And uh, I can't wait to, to jump in on this. Okay, so the course is entitled The Kabbalah of the Matrix. And I want to give you a little bit of history, personal history with the Matrix. Some of you may know this, the Matrix came out in the year 1999. I will tell you this. The year 1999 was a much simpler time. Yes, would you agree with me? All right, even if you don't agree with me, it was a much simpler time, right? <laughs> Ready or not, it was simpler. Um, 
1999, where was I? I don't remember exactly. You would think I would know where I was in 1999. Somewhere, yeshiva, traveling, summer. We did a summer in Long Beach, actually. Shmuley, in your uh, neck of the... Yeah, Huntington Beach. Back in the day, yeah. Who didn't? All right. And um, I don't know if it was there that I saw The Matrix or somewhere else. It was a mind-expanding moment. And from that moment on, like when, when I first encountered the matrix, my first thought was, wow, this is very Kabbalistic. Someone should really do a class on the matrix. And now it's 20, almost 22 years later. And I feel very blessed to have the opportunity to study together the Kabbalah of the matrix with you. Um, by raise of hand, who has seen the matrix? I know some of you are off camera right now, but you can do the digital hand. Seen the matrix? Yes. So who? Okay, good. Who has not seen the matrix? By raise of hand, not seen the matrix. Okay. All right. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. If if you're in on the cabal of the matrix, I cannot afford not to offer spoilers. Did I give you too many double negatives there? I will spoil the film for you. All right. That's it. I mean, if you don't want it's to, okay. If we're being honest, it's been 22 years. Okay. It's been 22 years. So I, at this point, statute limitations go up on spoiler alerts. And I'm, I'm jumping in on this, especially because we need to explore these topics in Kabbalah. And we have to have a framework. So I want to begin with an anecdote that's going to work for those that know the movie. So I once, um, I was once, in, I once went to a, a kosher restaurant in in uh, New York City, and I see Keanu Reeves sitting down at the restaurant. Now you you might not think Keanu Reeves at a kosher restaurant, but legit, Keanu Reeves at a kosher restaurant, and he and I see the waiter comes out. I'm like I'm shocked, but you know I'm not going to go over. To waiter comes out with a bowl of soup, and Keanu Reeves takes a fork. And begins eating this the soup, and I'm like, I, I I couldn't hold myself back. I go over to him, like Keanu, like what what's with the what's with this what's with the fork? Why don't you use a spoon? And Keanu says to me, "There is no spoon." All right, if you know the Matrix, that only works if you know the Matrix. If you don't know the Matrix, you're probably wondering what am I talking about? Google, there is no spoon, Matrix, Neo, Keanu, etc. You'll you'll figure out what I'm saying. All right, that's my opening. So. The Matrix is a very deep film, and I will tell you straight off, straight off the bat, I have not watched in depth the second and third um, editions, and maybe that makes me a heretic, and maybe that makes me unqualified for this course, but I think, I think I'm qualified for what I am going to present throughout these three sessions. The three sessions that I roughly titled in the course outline on the website, we have the blue pill, blue pill the red pill, and the essence. I think we're going to reverse the order a little bit, talk about the red pill tonight, then the blue pill, and then the essence. If you don't know what red pill and blue pill is, it's also okay. Basically, I'll give a quick overview of the matrix to get started, and I'll mention the blue pill, the red pill, all that stuff, and then we're going to jump into the Kabbalah of the matrix. So what is the matrix? The matrix begins with a guy whose name is... Something Alexander. Am I wrong here? Is it Alexander? Yes. Did I get his name wrong? First thing off the bat, that would be very awkward if I got his name wrong right away. Thomas, Thomas Anderson. Not Alexander. Thomas Anderson. Thomas Anderson. didn't sound right. Thomas Anderson. He's a computer guy. He's in computers. And he, one day or one evening, there's a message that's on his computer screen where he's sleeping. And the message is... Follow the white rabbit. Something, something mysterious. Follow the white rabbit. He follows clues. He's introduced to people. Before long, he gets introduced to an, 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 an incredible, mind-blowing idea. And that is that nothing that he knows to be true is actually true. The premise of the matrix is that nothing that he thinks is true is actually true. Because while he thinks it's 1999, and he's living his life, his best life, or not best life, in 1999. In fact, it's 200 years in the future. It's 2199. 
And human beings are now controlled by machines. It's one of those films, right? Those uh, machines took over. Anyway, hey, it's going to happen anyway. Kidding. So the machines have taken over and they are using, well, there's a whole battle between the machines and the humans and artificial intelligence and the humans, they, the machines were powered by solar powers. The, the humans blocked the sun. So the machines would die and then the machines took over the humans and plugged them in, plugged them in to use their bioenergy bio to, to fuel, because there's no sun, so they, 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 they harvest human beings and plug them in to get their energy. But to keep the human beings going, and I say this with a Talmudic inflection of the voice, to keep the human beings going, yeah? So they as they plug in the human beings to suck their energy, to power the machines, they put their brains, they hook their brains up to a a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a program, but more, more than a program, whatever the word, okay, word's escaping me, they, 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 pl they plug the brains of all the people into this software that's called the matrix that creates a fake environment, a fake reality to allow the humans that are all sitting in these pods hooked up to these machines powering the robots to believe that they're actually alive and living and moving. Are you with me? It's kind of like Facebook. I'm kidding. Although, although, one second, although, sorry, Mark, although, the other Mark, although I should say that Facebook a few weeks ago changed its name, its corporate name. Do you know about this? You know what its new name is? Yeah, Meta. You know why it's Meta? You know what Meta is? Yeah, it's about the metaverse. You know what the metaverse is? Yeah, it's like the matrix. Well, this time it's opting in to a matrix type existence. It's opting into a reality where you are an avatar or whatever operating in a, an artificial environment and you can interact with other people that are in that artificial environment. Again, 22 years later, it's about opting into this type of, this matrix, matrix-esque type of reality. Okay, back to the film. It's important that we set up the film before we do the Kabbalah, just so we see where the Kabbalah kind of um, interacts with this. So in the film, you have this guy who thinks he's living a life and he's a computer guy, but there's a message that comes to him. And the message that comes to him is essentially what you believe is real is not actually real. What you believe is life is not actually life because you are really a body lying in a pod 200 years down in the future, yeah? And you you only think that you're having these experiences. Pretty trippy, pretty trippy. Now, the, in the movie, the cool thing is that the people that are awakened to this reality, and that's when you're given the choice between the blue pill or the red pill. The blue pill is you stay in the matrix. The red pill is you can have the ability to transport out of the matrix into real life or into the real life, yeah, into, into real life and try to battle the machines to take back the people, the zombie people that are there whose bioenergy is being harvested to, uh, to power the machines. Anyway, it's a complicated plot. It has lots of twists and turns. And there's another few films and a fourth is coming out, which is what gave me the inspiration. To, uh, to launch this course because The Matrix Resurrections, it sounds pretty cool, is coming out on December 22nd. So I figured let's get, let's, let's get in a few sessions before that film hits and uh, we'll see what we can, we can teach the, the filmmakers a thing or two before, before they get started with this launch. Back to, back to the script. So this guy, Neo, well, his name is uh, Thomas Anderson or Mr. Anderson as Agent Smith likes to say. Anyway, so this guy Anderson is faced with a choice. Do you want to stay in the matrix, take the blue pill and forget, you know, anything else and just live your computer simulated life? Simulation is what I was looking for before. Live your simulated life or take the red pill and your eyes are now open to the truth that all of this is a lie. And there's another reality that's kind of horrible. Um outside of this realm and this is fake and all that stuff he opts for the red pill the rest is history 
And now you have a plot. If you took the blue pill, that's it. The movie ends in the first, I don't know, 20 minutes. If he takes the red pill, now you have a franchise that makes billions of dollars and everyone makes money and everyone's happy. Good, fine. So he took the red pill, Zygus. The, the big idea, you know, when I, when I originally encountered the Matrix 20 something years ago, I, what struck me is this idea of, you know, the, the existential question that the Matrix brings up, which, I'm sh- which is not unique to me, which I'm sure anyone who watched the Matrix, I'm sure all of you who have seen or encountered the Matrix also probably thought about, which is, well, hold on one second. How do we know that this is real, right? It's like that meta um, awareness of like, hold on. It's like in the horror film where the person's watching the horror film and they're like, just look behind you. And meanwhile, there's somebody behind them. Yes. All right. If you don't get that reference, it's also okay. So it's like we're, we're watching the Matrix. We're watching a guy become, you know, his eyes open to the fact that there's another reality outside his own and this is all fake. And then you're like, wow, that's so trippy. And then, and then you think the next obvious thought is, well, hold on. How real is this? And would we know if this wasn't real? That's the real question. Would we know if this wasn't real? How would we know if this was real? In other words, if it's a closed system, if the simulation is perfect, if the simulation is perfect, yeah, then how do you ever know that it's only a simulation? So in the movie, there are glitches We call this glitches. (laughs) That's the scientific term. Glitches in the matrix. When there's a glitch in the matrix, like, I don't know, a black cat walking by twice. Yeah. The old deja vu, little uh, Easter egg to mix metaphors, the little deja vu situation. You're like, oh, what was that glitch in the matrix? That's the clue for the matrix movie people, characters that th- this is just a matrix, it's a simulation, it's not real, there's something else. It also helps if you have more Trinity and Morpheus and the Oracle and the architect and all the, all the, uh, all the chevre, as we would say, all the, all the folks of, that, uh, of, uh, of, of the film. But how would you know? How would, when I say you, literally you, how would you know if you are real if, what you're, if the life you're living is real or a simulation, how would you know? If it was a, if it was a perfectly, perfectly designed simulation, you would not know. Which begs the question, is this real? Or is it a simulation? What's interesting is that Kabbalah addresses this question. And that's where this course picks up the conversation. This course addresses the question, is this real? Or actually, maybe even more importantly, what is real? Or in other words, what is reality? What is existence? What is real? How do you define reality? And is this that? And if it's not, then what is? Rabbi, Rabbi, yes. what's Stand the it. this? What's the this? Is this the, real? What is this? Good, good, good. Excellent question. It's what I would say in, 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 in my questioning, what I'm referring to is the supposed reality that you and I are aware of. In other words, the, 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 this, your consciousness and your environment and your yourself, your awareness of self and awareness of your body and awareness of the space that you're in and the people that you interact with, the physical contours of reality. Is that real? Is that real? Or is it like in the matrix with Neo, is it a simulation? Now in the story, in the movie, he's able to, you know, he's, there's an intervention done, so to speak. And he's woken up to the fact that, Hey, this is not real. There's something else. And you got to fight to bring the, to, to crash this matrix and get everyone back and fight against the machines, whatever. Plot unfolds from there. But the question really is, again, getting back to my question, my question is, so if we think about that in our context, no, is this real? <laughs> is any of this real? 
Is it a simulation? I, I mean, the, now the truth is just because you see a movie doesn't mean we have to question everything, right? I mean, it's a movie, it's made up, big deal. But it's a good question. It's a good question. Because the question really comes from a place of how would you know if it wasn't real? If, it was, if the simulation was airtight, no glitches, no glitches, how would you know? So here's the crazy thing. And I mentioned this a moment ago. The crazy thing is that Kabbalah, over thousands of years ago, discusses, discussed, and to this very day discusses these very questions. Now, I have to tell you, the language of Kabbalah is a little bit different than the language of Hollywood, right? It's not going to be packaged in the same type of dialogue and the same type of uh, language. It's, it's written in a different language. To, uh, to use the theme of, of, of this series, it's encoded in a different language, or it's coded in a different language. Nonetheless, Kabbalah speaks to the exact questions that the Matrix series evokes. Is this real? What is real? How would we know if it was or wasn't real? And who, maybe who cares if it's real or not? That's another question. If it's not real, who cares? If we think it's real, isn't that enough? Perception is, is good enough. Maybe perception is, for all intents and purposes, reality in this case. But I think we want to know. And Kabbalah has just a mind-blowing uh, response to this question, an absolutely mind-blowing response to this question. So what we are going to do, what we are going to do in this series is look at some original sources of Kabbalah and address the question. Address the questions that we asked before. Is this real? What is real? Etc. And in the process, I think we're going to walk away with a lot of new information and a lot of insight, practical insight into what it means to live not only an enlightened life and a true life, but also live a good life. Because it's hard to live a good life if we don't know what life actually is or what reality is. Anyway, either way, hopefully, <laughs> as part of the objective of the series, Hopefully your mind will be expanded. You're going to learn Kabbalah. Mind will be expanded to some new ideas, some trippy ideas, some Jewish ideas. Um, it's good to see the trippiness in, uh, in, in, in Judaism. So, so let's, uh, let's start. I want to tell you before we jump into some texts and, and some sources that the primary source of this series is from the second section of the book of Tanya. Book of Tanya was written by the founder of Chabad. His name was Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi. He was born in 1745. He passed away in 1812. The Alter Rebbe, as he's known, the Alter Rebbe founded the Chabad Hasidic movement, was a prolific scholar and author, uh, both the revealed parts of Torah and the mystical dimension of Torah. He's a, he was a Kabbalist, a Hasidic master, a mentor, a tzaddik, a Rebbe, just, you know, Put in as many adjectives as you as as you can think of, and it positive adjectives and, and applied to him. Um, he authored the book of Tanya, which is considered by many to be one of the greatest spiritual, practical spiritual guides ever penned. In the second section of the book of Tanya, he explores the fabric of existence in just the most mind-blowing terms. Now, all of what he writes is based on prior Kabbalistic sources. He weaves it together. He frames it in a beautiful fashion. It's not originated. These are not new ideas from, 18, from the late 1700s. These are ancient Kabbalistic, mystical Jewish ideas that he articulated in a profound way. So that's by way of introduction as far as the source, the primary source that we're going to be using. In the Hebrew, the source is called Shar Hayichud Veha Emuna, which means the portal to unity and faith. It talks about the fabric of existence, as you'll see. All right, before we get started, let me check in and make sure we're all on the same page and check and see if there are any questions so far. Questions so far or comments before we jump into some texts? Mom, don't forget to unmute. 
I just have one question. Why should it not be real? Why are we doubting? Good, good. So the, the basic, you know, a very basic answer would be, look, when you encounter um, ideas and, and suggestions that might challenge the idea that, that things are real, it just it creates the question in the mind. Like, how do we know this is real? Who says it's real? Um, but I think there's, there is a, there's an innate question that human beings have. The question is, why are we here? Mm-hmm. Right? There's almost like a basic um, tension with existence itself. We ask, why are we here? And the question is, why shouldn't we be here? So it's almost like there's some innate sense that maybe this is not the true reality. Maybe there's some other reality. And the question, therefore, is why are we here? And again, this touches on, on, on some deeper themes that we'll get into in the Kabbalistic sources. But to address your question, why, why should we even think that this is not real? Again, number one, when we encounter suggestions that there might be a reality that's not real, it, it, it's, it, it raises curious questions. But also, I think there's, a, there's, an, there's an innate sense of, of questions. And sometimes, perhaps, sometimes we might see glitches in the matrix. Yeah, we might see glitches in the matrix. We might see something that happens that shouldn't happen based on the laws of, of nature. And we might question, well, hold on one second. Is this real? How solid are these laws? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So these are all, these are all um, kind of reasons or these are all angles to get into this conversation. But either way, even if we don't approach it from the, the space of a question, Kabbalah straight up directs this information toward us. And I, I feel very... Um, very excited to to share these these ideas with you. Um, I'm going to share a video. Rabbi, <clears throat> yes. Rabbi, um, Judaism's gifts to the world. We could say the red pl- red pill and blue pill. You know the two trees in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do they correspond exactly to the two trees? All right, Similar. close enough. Why not? Close <laughs> enough. But look, can we say that Kabbalah spawns? a deeper look at the universe, a deeper look at the fabric of reality, which then spawns a lot of philosophical conversation, including uh, screenwriting and and the matrix. I'm gonna say yes, as we'll see soon. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you and hopefully you can see that. Do you guys see that PDF, the Kabbalah of the matrix? Yes, Yes. nod, thumbs up, yes, Yes. okay. This is session number one. I just like this, I like the screen. By the way, for those that are unfamiliar, for those that are familiar, you know what this is, but for those that are unfamiliar, so the matrix is a a simulation of code. So when the character Neo, oh, I don't know if I mentioned Neo. Neo is is the guy. He's Anderson, right? He's called in in the, the real world, he's called Neo, which is the same letters as the word one because he is the one that's going to rescue all of humanity, the one, the Messiah figure. Many scholars, by the way, scholars, many analysts, analysts, many film fans have debated whether the Matrix is based on Judaism or Christianity or, or um, Buddhism. You know, it, has, it has a lot of elements from a lot of different faiths. But in this, in this, ses- in this series, I, I'd like to demonstrate the um, Kabbalistic framework around a lot of these ideas and and some things that go beyond, obviously, beyond the film and uh, taken in a completely new direction. Okay, back to uh, back to my PDF. So we can follow along together. The Kabbalah, the Matrix. Here we go. Session number one. So this 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 class is going to be divided itself into three parts. The series has three parts, um, three sessions. The first session has three parts. Part one, I'm going to go through the parts here. Part one is the Matrix. Part two is Miracles and Oracles. And part three is singularity of source. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna make my I'm gonna make my uh, PDF screen a little bit larger. It seems a little bit small here. Rabbi, so, you were starting to explain the the matrix to people that hadn't seen it. The the lines of code. Oh, okay. Yes, the lines. Oh, you, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So the lines of code. Oh, I got I got uh, carried away with Neo. So at the end of the first film. 
again, spoil, spoiler alerts are going to abound in this series. Neo, who's our hero, one of our heroes, he, after a long series of events, he ends up becoming aware of, he's able to see in the matrix, he's able to see the matrix. You with me? He's able to see with his own eyes that what he thought was reality is really the code. He's able to see the code. And instead of seeing walls in a hallway, he sees this. He sees this. He sees the code everywhere. And that means that it no longer has a hold over him. The structure, the limitations of the so-called reality, once he knows that it's not real, it's just a simulation, it's just a program, and he exists on some level outside it, it no longer holds sway over him. Are you with me on this? It no longer controls him because he realizes that this is just a simulation and he is outside and beyond that simulation. Okay, so that's the, that, those are the lines of code. This is fame. This is like when you think of the matrix, you think of like the lines of code. What's wild about this is that Kabbalah speaks of our reality as being created by code. And just like in the matrix, the code is comprised of letters, characters, numbers, et cetera, characters. The same thing is true in the Kabbalistic understanding, understanding of reality. So part one, the matrix. Okay, part one, the matrix. This is the matrix according to Kabbalah. Because as we'll see now, Kabbalah has a very definitive and articulate understanding of what our matrix is. And yes, we do have a matrix. So the theoretical questions I asked before, like, is it real? Is it not real? Is there a matrix? Are we in a matrix? Kabbalah says the answer is absolutely. Everything that we see, everything that we experience, the very reality, the very limitations of our reality is all powered. It's all a simulation. It's a creation. It's a matrix that is superimposed to create this reality. It's not the original reality. Let's jump in. I'm going to read this. The reason why I, I feel like I'm going to end up doing a decent amount of talking in the session, just because I want to throw in a lot of commentary in, in these lines of, of, um, of, of the text. Now, I mentioned before, I'm going to mention one more time. All of this, all of the, the texts here are all coming from the same source. Second part of Tanya, Shari it's the It's the second part of the magnum opus of the founder of Chabad, Tanya, taken from original sources and compiled in a beautiful way. So let's jump in. The Altarba writes the following. It is written. Forever, O God, your word stands firm in the heavens. That's our opening verse over here that, we're, that, that he analyzes. Forever, O God, your, your word, your word stands firm in the heavens. What does that mean? So the Alta Rebbe quotes the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was the founder of the general Hasidic movement. The Alta Rebbe, as I mentioned before, founded the Chabad Hasidic movement, but the Baal Shem Tov, who lived a few generations prior, he founded the general Hasidic movement. So the Baal Shem Tov, blessed memory, has explained that, quote, your word, which you uttered, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, these very words and letters through which the heavens were created stand firmly forever within the firmament of heaven and are forever clothed within all the heavens to give them life. I'm going to continue finishing this paragraph and then I'm going to go back. As it is written, and the word of our Lord shall stand for, firm forever, and as it is likewise written, and his words live and stand firm forever. Let me explain what he's saying here. What he's saying is that the very existence of heaven, and this is not referring to a metaphysical heaven. This is referring to like the, um, the sky, the atmosphere, right? That which is above the earth, but still physical creation, the heaven. So that, he's, the Baal Shem Tov says, is powered completely by God's words by God's articulation of speech, by God's 
communication. Which communication? When God says at the beginning of the Bible, when God says, let there be a firmament or let there be a heaven, and that creates the heaven, those words, let there be a heaven, let there be a firmament, those words themselves are the characters that create the reality of heaven. And the same thing is true for every element in existence. The same thing is true for everything that exists. This is what he continues to say. We have some excerpts of this, but you'll see it soon inside. Everything that exists is powered by divine letters. Now, you're wondering what are divine letters and what is it, how, how does it make sense? Think of the matrix, right? Think of a computer program. Every computer program is powered by code. You code software. Software is all created by code. Code is all made up of letters. Centuries and millennia before computers and computer code, the Kabbalists conceived of and spoke about a divine code, a divine code of reality, a divine code that creates as a program, if you will, heaven and earth. That is essentially what we just read in that text, that everything that exists is powered by God, but more specifically, by God's articulation of speech, by divine code that takes, that, that is comprised of literally letters and words. Communication, characters, letters. That's what, that's what sustains reality. which means, and this is going to unfold in tonight's session, which means that this, this, not only down here, but up there also, right? This is only real insofar as God prog programmed it into existence. But prior to that program, it's not actually real. Are you with me on this? Yes. La olam Hashem, devarcha nitza bashamayim, forever, O Lord, devarcha, your word stands in the heaven. In other words, heaven doesn't exist without your word. If that, if that program, if that matrix, right, the real matrix. Our matrix, not the film matrix, the real, the, Kabbal, the Kabbalistic matrix. If that matrix were not to have existed, if God were to never have programmed existence, our existence, into existence, this wouldn't be here. This is, it's not a given that we're here. This is all a creation. It's all a program. It's all a sim, I want to call it simulation. It's all, it's, it's all an architecture on top of whatever that original reality was we call God. This is, a, this is a, a layer on top of that to create the framework for our reality and everything in it. Again, imagine if you've seen the movie, you can maybe picture it in your mind. Imagine that scene where Neo at the end of the first film, where Neo suddenly is like, He's enlightened and he's able to see that nothing is real, that it's all the matrix. This is what Kabbalah is telling us, that everything exists because it's being powered by God's words, by the letters into existence. The very fabric of reality is divine code. Straight up software, using modern language. The Kabbalists would call it, divine speech. The, the Jewish, the original Jewish sages in Perkei Avot say 10 utterances. Yeah. The, in, the, in the fifth chapter of Avot, Perkei Avot, it's one of the Mish, Mishnah, 1800 years ago. It's not Kabbalah, it's straight up Mishnah. Our sages said, Basara mamarot nivraha olam. With 10 utterances, God created the world. And the Kabbalists say, what does it mean 10 utterances? Code, divine code. I'm translating a little bit modern language, divine code. Divine code is what makes this reality real. 
which begs the question, how real is it? If it's only created by a divine program, okay? It's created to be real. It's not OG real, right? It's not originally real. It's imposed, created to be real. It's not originally real. It wasn't always. This is a, a creation. Okay, that's step one. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of ideas to get through. This is just step one. Okay, let, let me continue inside and uh, read a little bit more. Unraveling. So the author Rebbe continues to say the following. Okay, this is the paragraph right here at the top of the page. If the creative letters, what I'm referring to as the divine code or simulation, if the creative letters were to depart, listen to this, were to depart. In other words, if the code would fold, even for an instant, God forbid, and return to their source, if the letters that are powering this matrix, our matrix, the re like the real one, our real, maybe fake matrix, if those letters were to go back to the source, so to speak, right? All the heavens, listen to this, would become not an absolute nothingness. Everything would, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'm going to create a new term, unexist. It would undo itself. It would be undone. And it would be as though they had never existed at all, exactly as before the utterance, let there be a ferment. If for at any moment that, if at any moment you pull the plug on the matrix, if at any moment you pull the plug, everything disappears and it's as if it never existed. What does that mean? It's as if it never existed. It's kind of like the entirety of the matrix, this I'm calling this the matrix, right? Our reality, the entirety of, of the matrix only exists in so far as that matrix is being powered outside the matrix. The matrix is not real. In other words, it's only when you're inside that there's a semblance of reality. It's real when you're in it. When it's undone, there's no it to be in. When there's no it to be in, then it's not real. And it's not real outside of it either because it doesn't exist. It's like it never was. Its entire history, reality, the fab, the very fabric of its entirety is out. Does it make sense? You're looking okay. for, Ari, you're looking for the word revert. It would revert. Okay, yeah, yeah. But revert. I'm looking for a word that 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 expresses the idea that of completely being undone, completely unwinding of any reality to the point that there's not even a rosham, not even a um, a trace, no trace of there having of there ever having been a matrix. It's kind of like an example of light. If you want to use the example of a projection, a projector, film. Yeah, you, you're projecting a film. Um, so yeah, the projector projects a film by, by, by emitting light, light with the movement, like with colors, whatever. You pull the plug on the projector, this, the, nothing, nothing comes out. There's no image. There's no movie. You're done. It's finished. It evolve. Say it again. Devolve. Devolve. Good. Vaporize. Yeah, all, all of these. Yeah, I, okay. So the point is that it's it's un, it's undone. It's undone in its absolute entirety. It's undone to the point that it's as if it was never done in the first place. That's what he says. Again, that's what he says over here in this first paragraph of the second section here of unraveling, right? If the creative letters were to depart, even for an instant, and return to their source, all the heavens, right? would become not an absolute nothingness, and it would be as though they had never existed at all. Even the concept, the concept of past, are you with me? The past had never existed. Even the past is undone because past, the past of this reality is only true inside this matrix. If this matrix is gone, the entire past, everything, everything about this is undone. Let's continue. And now he expands it from the heaven to all of reality. The reason why we started with heaven is simply because of this opening verse that talks about God's word standing firm, the matrix, the code being present in the heavens. 
And now he's saying it's not only the heavens that are powered by a matrix, it's earth and everything in earth. And that's what he does right here in this next paragraph. And so it is with all created things and all the upper and lower worlds and even this physical earth and the realm of the completely inanimate. If the letters of the 10 utterances by which the earth was created during the six days of creation were to depart from it, but for an instant, God forbid, it would revert to not an absolute nothingness exactly as before the six days of creation. Every single thing that exists in whatever realm you're speaking of, I mean, other than the source itself, but any created reality, higher, lower, inside, outside, it doesn't make a difference, right? Physical things, spiritual reality within a created reality, doesn't matter. If it, if it was created, if it's powered by letters, powered by code, powered by this divine Kabbalistic matrix, yeah? If it's powered by this matrix, that means it's only it only exists as long as that code is valid, as that code is is operating if you undo the code if you remove the code if you delete the code if you unplug the code whatever you want to call it it's done it's gone it never was it never is it, it's completely gone rabbi yes that mean that we are manifestations of a code so in other words each of us is a code and if that's the case what does that do to what does that mean in terms of a soul? Does that also mean that the soul does excellent. it? Excellent, 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 excellent question. And I was going to mention this at some point. I was waiting for a big reveal, but let's do it right now. The soul is a piece of the source. Which means like in the matrix, where you have the characters that are existing in that, in that um, simulation. But then you have them, at the, then you have characters or as they are outside the simulation. The soul is a piece, piece, right? The soul is an entity, right? Again, entity, whatever, whatever you want to call it. The soul is a thing that is of outside the matrix, inside the matrix, okay? So the soul is a piece of source that's outside the matrix that's inside the matrix, but the body is of the matrix. And our consciousness right now is of the matrix. Our experiences are, are within this matrix. We have a piece that's outside the matrix, but all of this is inside the matrix. All, all, uh, most of everything that, that we experience, that we, th that we yeah, our interactions, everything is inside the matrix. It's all a, in essence, a simulation created by God. Simulation meaning it's not real in the sense that it, that which is real is absolute. That which is absolute is true. That which is true always was and always will be. Well, that's not the world. At some point, God created this, which means it wasn't always, which means this is a simulation. This is a creation. This is a code. It's, 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 it's layered on top of or it's superimposed inside of another space. And that's the space that we exist in. So we exist in this space. Is there an element of us that also is connected, tethered to something beyond? The answer is yes, that's the soul. But by and large, we exist in this space. Let's do one more piece. And then I'm going to read the chats because I haven't been reading them. And then we're going to open this up a little bit to discussion. Okay, this thought back inside. Soul force. This thought was expressed by the Arizal. He now quotes a 16th century Kabbalist, Rabbi Isaac Gloria or Yitzchak Gloria. This thought was expressed by the Arizal when he said that even within utterly inanimate matter, such as stones or earth or water, there is a soul and spiritual life force. That means, that is, Within them are enclosed the letters of speech from the Ted utterances, which give life and existence to inanimate matter, enabling it, or them, or it, inanimate matter, to come into being out of the not and nothingness that preceded the six days of creation. What he's saying here is, 
you find a stone. The stone just is. There's no software. There's no program. It's not moving. It's not breathing. It just is. Nope. Powered by the matrix also. That stone has a code to make it a stone. Again, when you see the matrix, when I say the matrix, when you see the film, the matrix film, everything, when you see the code, everything is code. But it's a, it's a mind-blowing idea that this is actually the way it is. Everything is divine code. Everything. The walls, look around your room. The walls are code. The table is code. Put your hand in front of you. Your hand is code. Everything is code. Different lines of code, different type of code, different utterances from God based on what it is, but all code. Which tells us something incredible about inanimate life. Everything that exists has divine code, powering it constantly into existence. If at any moment it was not being powered into existence, it wouldn't be. The implications of this are staggering, in addition to the mind-blowing concept that the question, is this all code? Is this all a simulation? The answer is 100% yes, which is shocking in and of itself. That should be enough of a big idea to take you through the week. But beyond that, we have other implications of this. Yeah? Number one, there's nothing extra in this world. Everything is being designed is being powered by code if it's here it's important it needs to be here it's kind of like think about a script we're talking about we're talking about a movie so think about a movie script someone wrote that scene or that character into the script for a reason you would think if god is scripting this stone this rock this person this situation into existence it serves a role how dare we, and I say this with love and collectively, how dare we destroy something of God's code? Are you with me on that? That's one implication. It's dizzying how many implications we have of this, of this idea, right? How can we go ahead and just destroy divine code? God says, I want this here. And what do we say? Nah, let's undo it. They tell a story. It's an old Hasidic story. Beautiful Hasidic story. The fifth Chabad Rebbe was walking with his son, who would later become the sixth Chabad Rebbe. So the Rebbe Rashab was walking, Rabbi Shalom Dober Schneerson was walking with his son, Yosef Yitzchak, who would become Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, the previous Rebbe. And he was explaining to his son the concept of some of these ideas. His son, his son was a little kid, but he was explaining how you know, God is creating everything constantly. He didn't get into the matrix and the code with that type of language, but God. And as his son is listening to him speak, his son, they're walking like a forest, a meadow, whatever it is. There's a tree and the son, the little boy, picks a leaf off the tree and begins ripping it into pieces. You know, like, you know, just mindlessly ripping a leaf into pieces. His father looks at him and says, we're talking about, right now we're talking about God creating everything, bringing everything into existence right now, and you're ripping a leaf? It's a perspective. Nothing is unnecessary. Everything is sacred. If code makes me, code also makes that stone, right? Make different code for different things, certainly, obviously, right? It's, not, it's all the same code. It, all, it would all look the same. So different code something's function in this way, something's function in that way. Inanimate matter means it doesn't have self-animation. It doesn't move. It doesn't grow. That's why it's called inanimate. It's not animated. That's its code. Our code is human code. Great. But everything has code. Everything is precious. Everything is designed by design, powered by God to be here. That's one implication. There are many implications, but I, I don't want to like spiral off too far into, into you know, related ideas. I want to stay focused on the big idea. You watch the matrix and you encounter a, a, a fascinating scenario. Here's a guy that's living a life and it turns out 
It's not real. It's just a simulation. Now, he thinks it's real because he's in it, but it's all a created reality, created from an external source. And what does Kabbalah say? Welcome to our world. Hello, we are this. This is us. That's where we are. We're in a world, in a reality that is created by code, by God. Coded by God. And if, if the word God, you know, if you're like, who's God? Use a different word. Make it easy on yourself. I'm saying if you have, you know, if you're wondering who God is, call it the source with a capital S. Sounds much cooler. Sounds super trendy. Sounds super trendy. You know, there's the source, the architect, the oracle, Morpheus, Trinity, Neo. We got, we got all these terms. We're going to go through all of them. Okay, so the source. You have the source. The source is beyond God, actually. Right. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Oh, oh, all right. We'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. God is the architect of the matrix. Beyond God being the architect, we have the source. But we'll we'll save that for a for um for a, maybe less than three where we go really deep into the essence. Okay. So what do we have here so far? We have a, we have a clear source, and again, this is based on. Many, many, many sources in Kabbalah. This is very articulate. Though. That's why I'm, I'm using this as the core of, of, this, of this class, of the series. That Kabbalah teaches that we live in a matrix. Powered by God, designed by God, coded into existence by God. Let's, uh, let, me, let me take a look at the text. I see at the chat, I see a bunch of chats coming up here. Um, Okay, I see a question is, should we dissolve to discover God rather than think, study, and pray intently? In other words, I think the question that's being asked is, should we seek to extract ourselves from the matrix or engage here in a, uh, in, in a healthy way? Good question. I'm not going to answer that right now. But it's gonna, we're we're going we're to see the answer to that as, as we play out the conversation. Um, Tov of chaos and emptiness before did God create that? Is that part of the matrix? That's a good question. Um, it's hard to say whether that chaos and void and emptiness and chaos is part of that simulation, part of that matrix, part of the creation story, or it's pre-creation source. I'm not sure. Evolve, vaporize, none to revert to. Okay. Tov is the first reality, the Big Bang. Kabbalah Smith theory came to creation felt good. Manifestation of God, yes. Only awareness can help rise with the source. Code, same idea as frequency. Okay, good question. Is code the same as frequency? Could be, could be. The reason why I'm using code is for is twofold. Number one, the Matrix uses code and number in the movie. And number two, the, the mystics, the Kabbalists, the Jewish mystics literally talk about God's language as being the creative force, which is, I mean, letters. Letters of letters, like characters. And that's code. Code is with characters. Frequency is like it's I, it's probably the same concept, but just using different different language. Like what's true in the in the language of coding is true in the language of you know auditory sense. It's I'm sure it's this it's similar thing or the same thing, just speaking on a different wavelength. All all uh, puns intended. Um, isn't God the original code? Okay, so that's a good question. I'm referring to God as source, not code. Um, if everything is, Catherine asks a question, if everything is supposed to be here, how does evil fit into this code or plan? Good. Well, evil is programmed into the code. That's the short answer. The long answer is, stay tuned. The short answer is, evil is programmed into the code. How does free will come into play if all is coded? Excellent question. That's an excellent question. Can't answer that right now. Um, again, just to explain the question. The question is, if it's coded, right, is there free will? I guess we could ask the question on Neo. Neo's in the matrix and he's learning that there's uh, maybe another reality outside the matrix and being told like you could take the blue pill or the red pill. No, which one? Which well, one? you didn't see the third movie, so you don't know. Oh no, oh no, what did I miss? Shmuley. You, have, you have homework. I do have homework. I, by the way, I, I, I did. I did prep not by watching, but by reading 
but it's ain't a doyma shmiler ear. It's not the same. It's not the same to read it or to hear about it than to see it. All right. I I, I know that my my uh, initial framework is based on my framework of the movie is based on um, on one on film one. All right. I I I I, I have to. I have to ask for forgiveness before we start. That this is I'm a, I'm a bit limited in my the movie uh, the movie perspective, but the the, the Kabbalah I'm, I'm giving you straight up. Um, choices, choices. Smiths everywhere. I remember reading that Smiths everywhere. Agent Smiths are taking over. Anyway, that's my understanding of film three. Maybe did I get that right? I don't know. All right, no. All right, can't can't trust the internet. Um, our choice to be evil, creating sources ain't self, yes, creating earth, water, etc., creating infrastructure and coding. Yes, yes, it is like creating infrastructure and coding. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Imagine exa- a very simple example of all this conversation is imagine you're a, you're a coder, you're a software engineer, you're a software designer, you create software, you create a game, you create a, a world. Anyone ever play SimCity? You, you're creating a world. Someone had to create the ability to create a world. Somebody created a game in which the users of the game or players can create their own stuff. It's great. It's so meta. It's so awesome. But it's been done before. We're just replicating God at this point, which is the source, which is just replicating the process that happened to us that we're still in. This is very meta. It's like the code within the code within the code which is fine. It is what it is, but it's like, but the point is section one of today's classes, the matrix. I, I know the Beatles said we all live in a yellow submarine, but the mystics say we all live in a green matrix. Okay. I, maybe not green. I just added that for artistic embellishment, but we all exist in the matrix, my friends, a divine matrix, a godly matrix, right? Sure. But a matrix, nonetheless, matrix, meaning this it wasn't this wasn't until it was and it was made by god in such a way that it seems so real it seems so real the contours of our existence seem so absolute it seems like this always was it seems like these this the structure is 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 solid we don't see the matrix we see the stuff. We take it serious. We take it very serious. Which leads me directly into section two of today's class. Rabbi, sorry. Yeah, Can Sandy. I, um, in, in another context, you referred to someone, and I don't know who it was, who it was. And you say, we, I think we were talking about how things got their names. And you were saying that this person was able to see the essence of something. So in this context is the implication that that person was able to see actually not the the, the object, but to see the code and yeah. to interpret the code with a with a label. Yes. Who yes. Was, yeah. Do you, who, who, was who was this masked man? Yeah. It was the masked namer. Kidding. This was this was Adam. It was Adam. Laura tells us that Adam of Adam and Eve fame. Adam of uh, Garden of Eden expulsion uh, infamy. Adam, the Torah says, gave all the animals their names. And the Kabbalists asked the question, who cares? Why does the Torah have to tell us this? The Bible says, Adam named all the animals. Yeah, wonderful. So I named my cat also. Like, like I don't have a cat, I'm just saying, right? Like, what? why is that relevant? Why is it relevant? So the mystics tell us, it's very appropriate. It's very important to know this because it's giving us insight into Adam's perception. Adam was able to see the code and he was able to, and the code contained the letters that then gave rise to the name of each animal. He named the animals, at least in Hebrew, he gave them names that were appropriate given the specific code for that animal. Yeah. If, 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 anyone has dabbled in, in, in code. So, you know, that there's certain strings, certain characters. If you know code, you know code, right? And you know code, when you see something, you see a color, you're like, oh, I know that code, right? Zero, 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 whatever it is. You know what, you know what that color is. You, you, you connect the two. You see a color, you know the code. 
You see the code, you know the color. Adam, Adam connected it. This is before the sin. Post sin, post sin. You and I, nope. No code for us. No code for typically, typically, typically. We're, we're about to get a little bit deeper. Now, let's continue by talking about miracles and oracles. In the Matrix, one of the main characters or one of the big characters is the oracle. The oracle. Who is the oracle? The oracle is a very wise woman who has insight. She has a lot of insight into the Matrix, into destiny, into history, into lots of things. Let's get back inside. And uh, I'm going to share my screen once again with you. Part two. Again, this text is coming from from the second section of the book of Tanya. Let's jump back inside the text. Making the matrix. So now that we know that there's a matrix, let's talk about making the matrix and why making the matrix is different than making something inside the matrix. Ooh, let me say that again while I can see you without a screen dominating my screen. Making the matrix, as we'll see now, is radically different than making something inside the matrix. Does that make sense what I'm saying? To make something inside the matrix means that you take code and you, you play with it based on the rules that you have, based on the tools that you have, based on the substances that you have, you're modifying things or whatever it is inside the code. That's easy. To make the matrix, that's a little less easy. Let's jump in and see that and see why that's relevant. I mean, who cares what's easy, what's not easy? You'll see. Rabbi, can yeah. we, can we um, work or manipulate the code since we're part of the source? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, yes. Yes. Especially those that even in their physical condition have a sense and a transparency to the source. Those are individuals who can bend, in some instances, the matrix. And we call those people sadikim, who have the ability to manipulate. There was a group of college students. I heard this story from the rabbi himself who took this group of college students to Brooklyn, New York, to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe back in the 1960s or 1970s. And one of them, one of the college students, I think it was Rabbi Feller from Minnesota. Just a great rabbi. Been in Minnesota for decades. Anyway, he brought a group of college students. I think it was him. He brought a group of college students to the Rebbe and, and, and one of them, they had, they had, a, they had a meeting, they had a, a powwow, a schmooze. One of them says to the rabbi, they say about you that you can perform miracles. Is that true? And he, the rabbi's like, oh, no, like, oh, you don't ask a rabbi that. It's like too direct of a question. Who asked the rabbi that? I guess he didn't prep his group, you know, about like the, the proper protocol. You don't ask a rabbi like, hey, can you do miracles? It's like just a little too, I don't know. Anyway, the rabbi said the following. The rabbi said everything that exists physically, right, exists so because of its spiritual origin. So if you could tap into the spiritual reality and change something there, then in, by consequence, the physical thing would also be modified. That was the way the Rebbe asked the question. Yeah, sorry, answered the question. You know what that sounds like to me? Yeah? First of all, what's the answer? Yes or no? What's the answer? Yes. And how do you do it? In the language, I know, okay, you're all muted. I muted you guys. All right. I know you can unmute, but what, I'll just keep it, keep it easy here. How do you do it? You change the code. Yeah? You with me on this? Manipulate the code. Yeah. Okay. So, but before we get, we, that's, that's like a big idea in response to a question, but let's back, could jump back inside to the text that I want to read with you. Making the matrix. So the author Rebbe continues and says the following. This is the response to the heretics 
And there is, and there in this idea is exposed the root of the error of those who deny two things, individual divine providence. That means that everything is guided. And number two, those who deny the signs and miracles recorded in the Torah. So let me explain. There are people who say, oh, come on, divine providence. Ugh, everything's by happenstance, big accident. Yeah, it's accident, coincidence, yeah, divinely orchestrated, divinely ordained, Baba Mises. Some people say, oh, the miracles of the Torah, come on, Baba Mises, fiction, fables, not, not real, tall tales, etc. My kid came home this week with homework. He is in fourth grade, and he's learning the difference between fables, tall tales, legends, myths. It's not you. It's Shia. Yeah. Good night, Ali. Anyway, so... Um, and, I, and, and for all these years, I had no idea there was a difference. Right? I always lumped them together. Tall tale, myth, fable. It's all like, sure, it's all not true. But no, they're very, very specific, very different. Anyway, back, back here. So there are people that believe, people that, that feel like, ah, there's no divine providence. There's no, no, nothing, no higher power in charge. The signs and miracles, nah, they're not real. So the Alter Rebbe says, we just, based on what we just discussed, Again, in Kabbalah, we've undone, though, that, that perception, that per, the, the cynical perspective. Divine providence. Of course, there's divine providence. So this is all code. It doesn't get any more divine providence. Divine providence means that everything is orchestrated, that everything is designed. It's code. It's, been co it's being coded into existence. What do you mean it's not divine providence? What, what kind of accident? It's literally being coded right now for you. What accident? Where's the accident? I understand there's a question about free choice. I get that. We're going to have to save that for a little bit later. But the idea that things are, are, are happening exactly as planned and 100% based on code, based on this understanding of code. And what about signs and miracles also? Why signs and miracles? Because if you have code, the source can decide to override the code, to change the code, to cut the code, to splice the code, right, to paste the new code, the source can decide at any time to um, adjust the code and create what we would call, and what I mentioned before, a glitch in the matrix. And I should mention parenthetically, it's not in this text right here, but Kabbalah teaches that on occasion, the source does that, the Ain Sof God does that to the code. Why? To remind us that this is just a code. That this is just code. This is not the true reality. This is a this is a reminder. The glitches in the matrix, the miracles, the the big things that happen outside what could normally be be chalked up to being you know just the way things are. That's a reminder that this is all part of a code. Back inside. Back inside. Back inside. So. The Alter Rebbe writes, they err in their false analogy in comparing the work of God, the creator of heaven and earth, to the work of man and his schemes. I'm going to keep, keep on reading, and then I'm going to explain. When a silversmith has completed a vessel, that vessel is no longer dependent upon the hands of the smith. And even when his hands are removed from it and goes his way, the vessel remains in exactly the same image and form as when it left the hands of the smith. In the same way do these fools conceive the creation of heaven and earth. However, their eyes are covered so that they do not see the great difference between the work of man and his machinations, which consists of making one existent thing out of another already existent thing, merely changing the form and appearance from an ingot of silver to a vessel, and the making of heaven and earth, which is creatio ex nihilo. I said this before. I'm going to repeat it. There's a difference between making something in the matrix and making the matrix. To make something in the matrix, you're not creating code. You're using existing code and you are, you're working with existing code. 
as you were coded to do. You were coded to be able to work with the other tools and code in this space. All of that is well and fine. But to create the code, to create the matrix, that's a higher thing. The activating force of the creator must continuously be present in the thing created to give it life and ongoing existence. Let me explain. People, people, philosophers, many philosophers believe that there was an original source, a God-like figure who created this and then checked out. And now existence exists on its own without any uh, outside force, without any you know, intervention. And he's debunking this, saying when you understand the matrix code, that doesn't make sense. Why not? Because why do you think that something can exist without, without inter intervention or interaction? Because you make something and you can let it go. So somebody made this LaCroix can. Someone or something made this. And then it stopped making it. And it still exists. So the Alter Rebbe is laughing. He's saying, you know why it still exists? Because there's code. You didn't make the code. That's why you don't have to still be touching it. <laughs> Who made this code? God. God still has to touch it. Are you with me on this? It can exist without you because you're not the originator of the code. So you can touch things and move things around, and that's fine because you're not creating the, the essence code. But the coder, the original source of the code, needs to continuously be, be pumping in that code to make it exist. So you say, I painted the painting and it, st it stayed there without, without me touching it after that. Shkoyach, thank you very much. Because you didn't make it. You didn't make it. You moved some colors. You took colors from a thing to, a, to another thing. You put it from one place to another. That's what you did. You didn't create it. You didn't, what, what did you create? Again, I'm not trying, listen, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that our artists don't create. They create in our terms of creation, but they don't create, create on God's terms. They don't create on that level. Creation means that the, the strict Kabbalistic definition of creation is to bring something out of nothingness, is out of nothing to make something new emerge, out of nothing, not out of a pre-existing something. Creating the matrix is not from a previous matrix. It's out of nothing. There was no matrix, and now there's a matrix. So you take paint, and you move it from your palette to a canvas. Beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's wonderful. You can walk away, and it still exists, because you didn't create the code of the paint, or the dye, or the uh, whatever you make paint from, whatever those materials are. You didn't create that. So of course, it doesn't need you anymore. <laughs> Wait, it, it did The pigment, it didn't need you then. It doesn't need you now. You moved it around the canvas. Beautiful. But it doesn't need me. Yeah, of course it didn't need you. <laughs> it doesn't need you because you didn't make it exist. You, you brought it into existence. You created the... You didn't create it. All right. God, who is the creator of this code, God is still needed. God is still constantly powering it. This is, again, just speaking to the theme of constant creation. Back inside, we have one more paragraph to go in this section. The activating force of the creator must continuously be present in the thing created to give it life and ongoing existence. In other words, the matrix, simple terms, the matrix is constantly being pumped, formed, fashioned into reality. This reality, the reality that we know and love, is constantly being animated into being activating forces such as the above are the self-same letters these activating forces of existence yeah those are the letters of speech that constitute the 10 utterances by which all beings were created and with this last line he says what is this activating force of god that makes everything exist that's the code that we were speaking about before that's the code the letters divine speech divine utterances that's exactly what we've been talking about the whole time it's the code now we get to miracles and miracle makers and oracles. <sighs> uh, 
it's pretty incredible because all the excerpts that I pulled, I didn't put anything in a different order. It's exactly in the right order. I, it's not the whole thing. It's, it's excerpted, but it's, the flow is incredibly, incredibly precise. He says, these supernal letters back inside are enclosed in the intellect and comprehension, which is to be found in their, their meaning the prophet's prophetic vision, and are enclosed as well in their thought and speech. As it is written, the spirit of God spoke within me, and his word is upon my tongue, as has been explained by the Arizal, the great Rabbi Isaac Gloria, the Kabbalist, and Sharnavu. What he says here is, I'm going to say it in my own words, there are people, I'm going to call them an oracle, call them a navi, a prophet, whatever it is, a tzaddik. There are people who, in their minds, in their minds, and in their speech, sorry, and in, and in their thought, and in their speech, are attuned to the matrix. There are people who see it, who understand it, who talk about it. There are people who are aware of it. And then there are people who just live inside of it without even being aware that there is a matrix. You with me on this? There are people who go through this life unaware that there is a matrix, believing that this is just real because it's absolute reality, believing erroneously that this is, that this is because it is, without realizing that it is nothing but a creation of God, nothing but divine code, nothing but a matrix. And then there are people who understand this and who talk about it. People who think about this, understand it, perceive it, and articulate it. These would be the prophets. The prophets communicated with the source, with the architect of, this, of, of the matrix, if you will, and with us communicating that there is a matrix. And this kind of summarizes this section. There are miracles and there are oracles, and both are intended on some level to accomplish the same thing. And that is like the cat in the matrix, like the black cat that appears twice, which is a glitch in the matrix, so to speak, the deja vu glitch, which is supposed to give, not, not supposed to, it's, it's in, in the case of the movie, it's a glitch. In, in, in God's case, in our case, there's no glitches in God's matrix. It's all by design. If there's a glitch, it means that it's an opening for insight. If you see something that's out of the ordinary, something that shouldn't have happened that happened, something that seems uh, some sort of anomaly, it's a message to not take the structure so concretely and absolutely. Don't take it to be so absolute. This is but a matrix that God has created, that God is creating, that, that the source is emanating, that is subject to modification or disruption at the source's choice at any time, any place. This is nothing just is. The walls that are standing in this room that I'm in aren't just solid standing walls because they are. If we could see it with our matrix, Kabbalah matrix glasses, we would see the code and realize this is just God coding this into being right now. At any moment, it could be coded differently or uncoded any, at, at any moment. And a miracle is essentially the architect, the source, the architect, giving us a glimpse behind the curtain. The same thing is true with a prophet or a tzaddik, someone who speaks about reality in different terms, speaks about the beyond, speaks about this just being a matrix. The same thing is true with what we're studying. Kabbalah means received. Kabbalah, we study Kabbalah. Kabbalah is received wisdom. We've been given wisdom that speaks of this, these realities in order that we should have a perception beyond the, beyond the matrix. I was going to say beyond the norm, but beyond, beyond this. Just think about that first movie, the opening of the movie, where you have 
not the opening opening, but the, the first scene with, with Neo, with our hero, the one where he's unaware, unaware of anything beyond his reality. And he follows the white rabbit. He goes down that rabbit hole and he begins to learn that this, all that he sees is but a simulation powered by something. Now, in the case of the movie, it's for nefarious purposes and whatever it is. Not all the details are lining up, obviously. But in our case, Kabbalah teaches that the source has designed a code, a space within which we operate, within which we are aware. But ultimately, there are glitches in the matrix on purpose, call those miracles. There are messengers in the matrix. We have trinities and morpheuses and we have oracles and art. We have messengers in this space that, we, that teach us about the beyond, that, that illuminate our eyes to see the beyond. Okay, Let's, let, let me stop for a moment. Questions, comments. Questions, comments. Okay. Make sense? Yes. All right. So what we, we spoke about over the last uh, almost 90 minutes is that we're all living in a simulation and everyone's like, yeah, no questions on that. We're good. Yeah. We're just, we're totally cool with that. All right. We're all in a simulation so, and so no, what, no big deal. Got a question. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's on late night. I mean, now that we know we're in a simulation, like let's might as well just kick back and uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yako. Apparently, um, you know, every now and then we we become aware of that that we're in um, we're basically creatures of habit and we sleepwalk through most of the week and we wake up and then we control we're more purposeful in our actions and then sometimes like you said we can rise above it all and realize hey all of this stuff is not that to be taken seriously this is just the game but i could also rise above it and observe and be the observer so that i'm not emotionally uh, manipulated by the game but i'm learning from it but i'm not getting overwhelmed by it so apparently awareness uh might be a way up and i guess my question is um when we go up even higher through you know, into, into like spiritual awareness experience. Um, is that still in the matrix or at that point are we getting out of the matrix? In prayer, deep prayer, meditation, et cetera, you know, sometimes. That's a good question. It's a good question. It's like, can even as we perceive the yeah. contours of our, of our own matrix, of this matrix, right? And we're aware of what's outside, you know, how do we know that that's not also part of the matrix, right? That that's not also part of, you know, still the code. I, I, I don't know that we can ever know that. I don't know that we can ever know, you know, like how deep the rabbit hole goes or how, when we can finally get out. I, I don't know that there's an answer to that. I mean, Kabbalah teaches an objective reality, which is that this is, co this is the code, this is the matrix, and there's beyond. How, how do we know and Kabbalah is uh, received wisdom, so we're receiving. We're, uh, we're, we're studying what's been taught in Kabbalah. Um, but you're asking a very good question. I, I mean, as we go along, the, the next few sessions, maybe we can, we can revisit that, but it's a good question. I'm looking now at the... At the um, so, ra Rabbi. Yeah, Mike. I, I guess if the follow-on question is, does reality exist? Yeah, so it exists to us. It exists to us. The question is, does it really exist? I think that's your right. question. Exactly. That's right. the question. Does it really exist? Yeah. Or and how, do, and how do you know it when you see it? <laughs> how would you know if you see it? Right. Good. So this is a perfect question. It's a great question. It's a perfect question to lead us into what we're going to talk about next week. And I mentioned this at the beginning um, that I wrote on the website, Red Pill, Blue Pill Essence. I think we're, we're doing the, um, sorry, Blue Pill, Red Pill Essence. We're doing the opposite. Tonight was about the red pill, exploring the matrix, but really exploring kind of like outside the matrix. 
seeing the matrix sort of from the outside in understanding that it's just a matrix. But next week, we're going to focus on, well, if this is not real, if it's not really real, if it's just a product of the source or the architect, whatever you want to call it, if it's just a creation, a, um, a simulation. So number one, how real is that? Number two, how does that work? How, how, does the sim, how, exa how exactly does the simulation work? How, how does it feel so real if it's really not real at all? And if it's not real, then are we real? Who are we? And, and where is this going? In the third session, we're going to connect this back up to the source. But in our next session, we're going to focus at length on what makes the matrix our reality, what makes this seem so real. That's the major focus of next week's conversation. I had three sections tonight that I wanted to speak about. We got through two of them, which is good because it helps me with pacing. Now I understand a little bit better about the pacing of, of our sessions. So next week, we're going to cover the last little piece that I want to speak about today, plus some additional pieces. But overall, it's going to be about what, what makes the matrix run. And what does that mean for us? That's next week. Let me quickly look at the at the at the at the, at the um, chat box. Um, our souls that is not metrics. How time correlates with metrics? Time is outside the code. Part of the code. Time is inside the code. Time is inside the code. Good question. Yeah. Time and space is all inside the code. Can you imagine a reality outside time and space? Uh, spoiler alert, you can't, you can't, you know why? Because you're in the matrix. You can only know what you know. Can't. You, you can try to conjure up an image of, or, or a mental, you know, imagination of what it would be like in a, in, in a realm beyond time and space. Good luck. You can't, you can't. We're so part of this matrix Yeah, it's not, it's not going to, we can learn about it. We can know about it. We can know that a thing outside exists, but to know what that is and what that looks like or feels like, impossible. All right, so let me summarize what we did today and then we'll officially close out and then I'll stay on for a few minutes for questions or comments. So what we did today was we briefly reviewed the essential plot of the film, The Matrix, at least the first, <laughs> the first one. Um, and we talked about how this movie depicts a guy who wakes up one day to find out that his whole reality is not actually real. And I said, that would be so crazy for us, right? And then we did the same thing with us. Our reality is not actually real. I mean, it's real to us, but it's a superimposed reality. It's a created reality. It's not a an original, essential, you know, it's, it's not an OG reality. It's a, it's a superimposed reality. It's a simulated reality that we're in. We didn't talk about today why God created it and what does it mean, but we, we have two more sessions to talk about this. So at the core, what we spoke about was that there's a divine code, the language of creation, divine utterances, 10 utterances that God used to create the world. We talk, talked about the Arizal, the Baal Shem Tov, the Alter Rebbe. We spoke about Kabbalah and Hasidic philosophy. We spoke about the fact that if the code were to, at any moment, any line of code were to be eliminated, that thing that it was creating would completely vanish as though it never was. Its entire past present and supposed future would be undone in that moment of undoing the code, which is a, another trippy thing to think about. And then we also spoke about the idea of glitches, glitches, glitches in the matrix. We call those miracles. We call those oracles, not glitches as in accidents, but seams where you realize it's not as perfectly smooth. It's not as airtight as I thought. And all of those are glimpses for us to see beyond where we are to realize that there's something higher outside of our individual spaces. All right. 
With this, I want to leave you with two practical things. Number one, recognize that everything around you, everything around you, including yourself, you also included, is being directed, empowered, and coded by God right now. Nothing is extra. Nothing is meaningless. Nothing is, is extraneous or superfluous. Everything is divinely ordained for you, number one. Number two, when life gets you down, just remind yourself, it's just code. It's just code. There's something else that's much bigger. This is just code. This too shall pass. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. We'll officially close out a quick announcement. And then we're going to get to a conversation for a few minutes. Um, Thursday night. Thursday night, we have the event of all events. Thursday is the fifth day of Tevet, which is the day celebrating Jewish books and Jewish literature. Why the 5th of Tevet? I'll tell you Thursday night. Join me Thursday night at 7 p.m. at Intown Jewish Academy on the Beltline in our beautiful Jeff's Place space for Bound to Inspire. It's an evening celebrating Jewish books and celebrating the people of the book. We're going to be having a cocktail reception followed by a beautiful multimedia experience where I'll walk you through the history of the Jewish printing press and some of the most notable books, Jewish books of all time. And then live and in person, we will be having a showcase of over 100 Jewish titles, quality, exceptional Jewish titles, books that are available to peruse and purchase to add to or build your Judaics library. It's a beautiful evening and a beautiful occasion to celebrate Jewish literature, books, reading, and studying. So join me Thursday night at 7 p.m. for this remarkable evening. You can RSVP on our website, intownjewishacademy.org slash books. But either way, I'd love to see you there. All right. Now the floor is yours. Let's do about three or four minutes. So if you have a question or comment, give me the short version so we can get to a few different people. All right. Jump in. I, I, I don't understand why why this is not reality. It's our reality that God created for us. How much right. more special could it be? Right, good. Much- so so from one perspective, right. So from one perspective, if this is our code, if this is our perception, it's reality. It might as well be reality. And that's true on one level. But yeah. Kabbalah is designed, one of the big ideas of Kabbalah is, is this it's designed to open our eyes up to recognize. Yeah. That when it comes to absolute definitions, this is not absolute reality. This is an imposed reality. The implications are incredible. The implications are incredible because if it's just this, then you do away with miracles. You do away with, with, um, with source. What you have here, and I, we didn't have time to speak about this, but I, and I'm not going to treat this at length here, but very quickly. Yeah. What you have in this conversation is essentially breaking the fourth wall. What right. you have in this conversation is breaking the fourth wall. And, and the question, I think, I think the question that you might be um, asking without asking is, why is it important to break the fourth wall? And no. I think my response would be, that is the most unbelievable thing that could ever happen. Because no. if this is real and the only reality, and that's all we know, and, that's, and, and it's true, this is what we know, and this is who we are, that's great. But then we don't have an interaction with the source. This reminds us that this is just a simulation. And knowing that gets a little bit closer to interact, to breaking down that fourth wall and being able to, on some level, interact with the, with the architect and the source. No, that wasn't my, my thing. I'm saying, why do we have to doubt that this is real? Of course, this is real, that there's more real, that there's more be, besides this reality. Of course, there's more besides this reality. But this is real because God gave it to us this way. Right. We, we the question have- is, good, good. The question is, real to who? That's the question, right? It's real. Yeah. It's real on one level, but it, the question of it's really real, and that's that's what we're exploring. Yeah, no, yeah. but I but I understand that. But what I'm saying is that it's also it it's real, and that and plus there's other stuff that's also even right. realer. Right. That's all, good. That's all. That's all good, I wanted good, good. to say. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, let's do another quick rabbi. Question. Rabbi. Oh, yeah, Donna. So. Um, if, you know, we had the discussion that if the code somehow is taken away, everything, 
But Repeat. are we to fear that that might happen? Be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Kabbalah is not saying one false move and boom, the code is gone. No. But the point is to realize that everything is empowered, is being powered by God right now. You and me in this moment and this experience, right? How bad could it be? Right. I mean, if you think about it that way, this is all being coded by God. It's an empowering message. Again, just to address it the same way. Number one, it's true. Number two, it's a very empowering message. We're not meant to be to be um, shaking in our boots like when's you know when's the other shoe going to drop and this whole thing goes bye bye. Um, okay. Am I allowed to ask another question? Uh, quickly, because I got I got to jump off in a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, about the is the reason that that Einstein didn't didn't discover the actual um uh, um I forgot it, what what he called it of of the the actual basis of all is is because it's it's actually hidden from us. I, this is beyond my pay grade. That that I can uh, Einstein's uh, stuff. That's. I that would be pure it. speculation on my part without any, uh, without any <laughs> yeah. theory of relativity. No, no, no. no. no, no His, no, no, the no. other one, it the theory of unifying theory. Yeah. The unifying, the theory. unifying That's theory. That's it. The unifying yes. theory. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I knew Jerry would help me. I, I have a unifying theory from the 1980s. We are family. All right. On that note, my friends, <laughs> it's great to see you all. I, I want to mention. One question. Please. Oh yeah, Anastasia, jump in. Yeah. <laughs> final word. Yes, uh, please. A uh, final. So my understanding is that um, the world was created um, pretty well, like when Adam and Eve was yes. uh, were living, and then uh, once Adam ate um, the fruit, it became with errors, right? It became well, what again? With errors. E R R O. Yes. Um, yeah, sort or, of, sort of. What matrix from the beginning was created by God, by God with errors? Yeah, but from the beginning. Coding. From the beginning. From, from the, the beginning, but the code, the bug in the code was not inside Adam and Eve. It was mm -hmm. outside. It was a serpent. There was a bug in, in the matrix. And the bug was outside the human being when they ate of the tree the bug is now inside <laughs> now it's more complicated oh. and that's that's the truth is that's a bigger discussion but according to kabbalah the, it wasn't completely perfect if it was by design because if it was without error as you said if it was without error then how did sin happen Mm -hmm. It's only possible if it was if it had that code. As anyone, if you design software, right, you can't, it's not like code invents itself. It's either there or it's not there. So if sin happened, it had to have been there. The code, the potential code had to have been, it had to be there to be activated. Anyway, but look, well, to be continued, we have a lot more to talk about. Thank you for joining me tonight, um, Richard and Jules. Great to see you guys. Everybody, great to see you all. I'm trying to see who did I not mention. Rabbi Dr. Seaman, welcome. Um, Tim and Rachel, welcome. Emilio, welcome. It's great to see you guys. Sam, welcome. Okay. I hope I got everybody. Rachel, Peter Malka. All right. Hopefully before or after we got, we got everybody. All right. Be well. Have a good week. And remember, it's real it's not real all right good um if you want i think i'm going to send out the handout the the pdf the the source sheet that we covered tonight i'll send that out it'll also have the third section i don't think i'm going to redo it unless they just leave that those pages off okay maybe i'll send you an abridged version with which is what we covered tonight i'll send it by email check your email check your local listings and your emails for more information don't forget thursday night 7 p.m join me for the book event to end all or to begin all book events. All right. We'll see you then. See you soon. Zai Gazun. Take care, everybody. Zai.